And I guess I should just acknowledge at the outset that immune stimulation is seen by a lot of investigators and companies working in this space as an unwanted toxicity and as something to avoid rather than as something to actually take advantage of. But I think there's actually huge uh, potential to this field, and it's a lot easier to uh, activate the immune system with nucleic acids therapeutically than it is to achieve some of the other purposes. So let me start, though, by saying, uh, by talking to the answer of the question, why is it that the immune system is activated by oligonucleotides? Because I think it's very important for us to understand that, either to avoid it or to take advantage of it therapeutically. Now, multiple different pathways recognizing nucleic acids appear to have evolved as a defense mechanism to detect infection and specifically to detect viral and intracellular infections. And the outcome of that that, uh, that has evolved is to induce interferon production, to restrict the viral replication, and to stimulate the development of a cytolytic T cell response involving CD8 T cells. And so therapeutically, there are applications where this could be uh, used and uh, be beneficial. Um, some of the examples of this uh, where foreign nucleic acids are detected by having modifications that are not present in our own bodies. Uh, perhaps the best example is the unmethylated CPG DNA. In our genome, when a C is followed by a G, the C is normally methylated at the five position, whereas in bacterial and viral DNAs, CPG is unmethylated. And so this is an unambiguous uh, sign of an invading pathogen. If you have highly unmethylated DNA, it's a reliable signal to the immune system that there's an infection here, and the immune system responds very rapidly with uh, activation triggered through toll-like receptor 9. Likewise, uh, unmodified RNA and endosomes, um, you just heard from Matt about the importance of N-1 uh, methylation on RNA. If RNA lacks that in endosomes, that again is a pretty unambiguous signal that this is a pathogen, and even more unambiguous if there's a 5' prime triphosphate or 5' prime diphosphate. That's an indication of a viral RNA. And so when the immune system detects those signals, those are pretty safe signals that something is seriously wrong. The immune system doesn't want to just easily make lots and lots of interferon because it's costly and it can lead to toxicity, but in these cases, uh, there's no choice. Now, some of the pathways recognizing nucleic acids probably have another function to detect tissue damage. When tissues are damaged, the contents, including nucleic acids, are released, and nucleic acids can wind up uh, being detected in compartments within cells from which they're normally excluded. So nucleic acids, RNA and DNA from the self, are normally not present in endosomes. If they are present, and if it's not an infection, then there must be tissue damage or something else that's going on. And that may lead to a different type of immune response than you want to generate in the setting of an infection, in particular, more inflammatory kinds of responses, TNF, IL-6, potentially even leading to tissue repair. An example of that type of mechanism might be the detection of double-stranded DNA in the cytoplasm. So normally, of course, double-stranded DNA is present in the nucleus. If it's present, if it's detected in the cytoplasm, that's a sign that something is wrong, not necessarily an infection, although it could be, but several pathways have evolved to detect that, staying in AIM-2, and I'll talk a little bit about those. And if RNA gets chopped up, then you don't have an N minus uh, one methyl. And so self RNA, again, can activate uh, these pathways as well in endosomes or potentially in the nucleus as well. Now, uh, we have a whole session in this meeting uh, talking about innate immune recognition, nucleic acid immunity. Uh, Gunter Hartman's going to be chairing that, and this is actually a, a picture from one of his review articles with Martin Schley. Uh, but just very briefly to um, uh, address what happens in this setting. So TLR9 is expressed in endosomes, and that can detect the CPG uh, DNA. That leads through MYD88 
to interferon production and also to NF-kappa B activation. And then in the cytoplasm, we have the sensors for double-stranded DNA, several of them actually, C-gas leading to sting activation, and sting leads to IRF3 activation leading to interferon production. But also uh, the IF116, AIM2 pathways leading to inflammasome activation, which has a very different effect uh, functionally, leading to IL1 beta and to a type of cell death. So DNA mechanisms uh, in the DNA recognition mechanisms in the endosomes or in the cytoplasm can have very different types of immune effects. And those may be different, uh, have different applications therapeutically, which I'll come back to. Conversely, for RNA, very similar principles. RNA detection also occurs in the endosomes through TLR3, 7, and 8, and leading to activation of interferon and NF-kappa B, very similar to what you can achieve with DNA in the endosomes. And then in the cytoplasm, there are multiple different receptors for nucleic acids in the cytoplasm. Rigai, which uh, requires a 5' uh, di or triphosphate, and then several other cytoplasmic sensors for uh, double-stranded RNA. And it's very difficult to avoid triggering those if you're transfecting a cell with unmodified RNA. But various RNA modifications, as you've heard before, can greatly reduce and avoid that activation um, if you uh, want to do that. So I've just highlighted here some of the differences uh, between these pathways, differences that I think are of interest um, between the TLR7-8, the TLR9, Sting, and the RIG-I pathways. One difference, of course, is where in the cells the recognition is occurring, the endosomes versus the cytoplasm, the activating ligands. There's quite a diversity of ligands that uh, can be recognized. And then in terms of the immune effects, um, plasmacytoid dendritic cells, or PDCs, are the major uh, interferon-producing cell in the body. And the only stimuli to really turn on maximal production of interferon from those cells are the toll-like receptors. The sting and the rig-I pathways don't strongly activate PDCs. But sting and rig-I do activate uh, conventional dendritic cells, or CDCs, monocytes. They can give an interferon response, but it's more of an interferon beta response. Functionally, I'm not sure how much that matters. Sting and rigai are really pretty ubiquitously expressed in many different cell types instead of being restricted uh, to immune cells. Basically, in mouse tumor models, everything works. It's very easy to get uh, tumor regression. But in terms of validation of activity in humans, only the TLRs uh, have been validated. And in the case of TLR78, there is an approved drug, a small molecule, not a nucleic acid, which is delivered topically to treat skin cancers and other skin conditions and is effective. And uh, CPG oligos have been uh, shown to be effective in human trials as well, although they're not yet approved. Sting and Rig I are in the clinic. I think this year or next year we may hear uh, results from the clinical trials involving those compounds, but so far they have not yet been uh, validated in humans. So how can this be therapeutically useful? Um, there are a lot of clinical development programs underway, and we're going to hear more about some of those programs at this meeting. Cancer has been the major focus of investigation for multiple different companies. Uh, three companies in particular uh, have shown that CPG oligos can induce tumor regression in patients with advanced melanoma in combination with checkpoint inhibitors. Really very impressive results. Dozens of patients now. Uh, in different clinical trials have shown benefit from uh, that approach, and I think that's going to be moving forward rapidly. Rigontech started uh, human clinical development this year of the first rig I agonist in trials. The results haven't been reported yet, but Merck just announced they're uh, going to be acquiring that company a few weeks ago. Many companies are developing sting ligands, and every big pharma has an interest in that. Those are cyclic dinucleotides, so not really oligo approaches, but I kept them in here for that. And uh, there's been a long history of interest in the TLR7 aid area, not quite as active as others, but MedImmune does have a program there. 
Vaccines are another huge area for nucleic acids, and Matt just uh, referred to that as well. And the vaccines can be infectious disease vaccines or cancer vaccines. A CPG oligos can be just added to a vaccine as an adjuvant, or as you just heard from Matt, mRNA vaccines where you encode the antigen, you have a built-in adjuvant effect from the innate immune activation of the RNA itself. And those are highly effective. They've also recently shown benefit in human clinical trials. Asthma is a little bit less well developed. The idea there is that the immune effects of the uh, TLR or innate immune activation will suppress the inflammatory response in the lungs. It works in animal models, has been less impressive uh, so far in humans. So let me just uh, say a few more words about the oncology application of this. What we're pursuing now in the clinic, along with several other companies, is intratumoral injection of a CPG oligo to alter the tumor microenvironment. And the idea there is that in tumors normally, uh, plasmacytoid dendritic cells are recruited by the tumor and actually are not in an activated state. They're in a resting state where they're maintaining self-tolerance and preventing immune rejection of the tumor. Patients who have large numbers of immature plasmacytoid dendritic cells in their tumors have a worse prognosis. Our theory has been that if we activate those cells in the tumor by injection of a CPG oligo, and we use CPGA, and I'll come back to that, that we can convert those dendritic cells from their unactivated resting state where they maintain self-tolerance to an activated state where they are fooled into believing that there is a uh, viral infection and they uh, promote uh, re immune response to whatever antigens are present in the tumor. So we don't have to add a tumor antigen. The tumor antigens are already there. The immune system has been ignoring them, but once you activate the immune system through TLR9, you stimulate the plasmacytoid dendritic cells, they coordinate an immune response with other dendritic cells and other cell types to drive a very strong T cell response against the antigens. Now, if that only worked to attack the tumor that you injected, it's not going to be a very useful therapy for patients with metastatic disease. And at the time that we started our company, we weren't sure that those T cells would go out through the rest of the body and attack tumors elsewhere, but it turns out that they do. We've had several responses of patients where you inject one tumor and you can see regression in liver metastases, spleen, lung, metastases in multiple different organs, and Idera and Dynavax have uh, reported the same thing. So I think this is an exciting approach to uh, tumor immunotherapy using uh, the CPG oligos in particular, and uh, you're going to be hearing a lot more about that uh, at this meeting and I think at other meetings as well. So let me say a few words now about designing these and about the different types of CPG oligos that uh, people work with. I'm not going to talk as much about designing the immune stimulatory RNAs because honestly, it's not that challenging. The challenge is to avoid designing an immune stimulatory RNA. You can take basically any double-stranded RNA or single-stranded RNA, and the odds are very high that it's going to trigger one or another of these TLRs. Um, or if you put a triphosphate on it, as long as it has a blunt 5' prime end, it's, uh, and it's a certain length, it's going to activate Rig I uh, as well. So with the CPGs, the CPGA is the most uh, challenging structurally. You'll notice that it has these poly G regions on the five prime and three prime ends. They don't actually have to have those regions on both ends, but you need them at least on the three prime end. What the poly G regions do is to form G tetrads that stack into G quadruplexes, shown over here, basically forming multimers. These spontaneously assemble into nanoparticles. And uh, with the CPGs in the center um, here, the CPGs are in a palindrome. And the other point I should make is that these oligos uh, normally are phosphodiester or if you have any phosphorothioate in them, the phosphorothioate is only at the ends. This type of oligo design does not work with a fully phosphorothioate modified backbone. 
And it turns out that the maximal activity of these oligos requires cleavage in the endosomes by DNAs2 as a part of the activation mechanism. So, um, so these assemble into multimers. If you think functionally about what these may be doing, uh, by having many, many uh, CPG oligos together, they may be cross-linking TLR9 in a way that's different from what a monomer would do. This is the first CPG oligo that we took into human clinical trials in 1999. Uh, just has a simple linear structure, full phosphorothioate backbone, um, activates B cells very well, but I'm going to come back to the differences if you don't have a higher ordered structure. And then the other major category of oligos is what we call the CPGCs. And uh, both Dynavax and Idera are in the clinic with CPGCs. The distinguishing feature there is that you have a palindrome or um, a dimer structure. Uh, Idera does it with a linker. And uh, this underlined region here shows the palindrome. So this would form a dimer. So potentially this could be engaging TLR9 uh, as a dimer and potentially linking two TLRs, uh, nines together versus many or one. So what's the difference of that functionally for the cells? It turns out that these signal in different compartments and they activate different signaling pathways. Even though they're working through TLR9, TLR9 is absolutely required for the activation by all of these CPG oligos. The CPGAs signal in early endosomes and they activate almost exclusively IRF7 in plasmacytoid dendritic cells. They're poor at activating B cells, but they induce phenomenal levels of interferon production from PDCs. Whereas the uh, CPGBs, on the other hand, give relatively weak IRF7 activation. It's mostly the NF-kappa B pathway. Um, the phosphorothioate backbone is very important for that. And that gives much more B cell activation, relatively weaker PDCs. And then the CPGCs are intermediate there. So there's still a lot that we have to learn about uh, the biology of those compounds. But let me just talk briefly uh, about how we screen them. And the screening actually is really very simple. Uh, we mostly just use human PBMCs in vitro. Um, we, I'll just show you very quickly some results of screening a whole panel of immune stimulatory compounds to show some of the differences that you get through different pathways um, with human PBMCs. We just play them in 96 well plates and analyzed by Luminex. This is a list of the different uh, compounds that we uh, screen in one assay, uh, CPGA, a CPGB, a couple of CPGCs. Um, CMP is the drug that we have in the clinic now, um, controls, and then a TLR7-8 ligand, TLR4 ligand, and so forth. And so in the Luminex assay, just to give you an overview, uh, IL-1 beta at the top, IL-10. So if you look at the IL-1 beta or IL-10 or IL-6 or IL-12 for that matter, the compounds that induce the strongest responses are the TLR7-8, uh, TLR4 ligands. None of the TLR9 ligands on the left-hand side really do a whole lot there. But when you look at the interferon alpha, uh, alpha assay, that's where the TLR9 agonists really shine. We get much stronger levels of interferon alpha production with TLR9 agonists than we've been able to achieve with any other innate immune pathway activator. And in particular, the CPGA subset are the strongest of all. So uh, I'm just including here a few references uh, for further reading if anyone is uh, interested in those. But honestly, no one yet has written a review article that tells you how to design these uh, for these effects or how to avoid them. And so I think I'm going to write one and submit it to uh, nucleic acid therapeutics. And uh, with that, I think we have a break. Very good. So we're almost.